soon as we wrote episode nine, we knew that it was gonna have to operate on a scale that we'd never operated before. We'd had a number of nighttime battles, we've had a number of sieges, but this is the first pitched battle, or at least the first large pitched battle. And so it was something different for us. All of it is action with almost no dialogue and lots of horses and many extras and the giants. The amount of supporting artists and the size of the crew, how many cameras they've got going, the magnitude of all the sets and everything, it's unbelievable. It was hard. It was a long, long slog. Luckily, we got Miguel Sapochnik back, who was our maestro from Hard Home in season five. That was basically a massacre. This is a battle. This is the story of a battle. We've never done that before. They really wanted to kind of get into the mindset of what it would be like to be in a battle like that. It was fluid all the way through. It morphed, it changed. But the most important thing all the way through is it can't just be a battle. If it's just a battle, the audience don't have stakes in it. You have to be following someone, and we decide to follow John. Ramsey weapon all the way through is antagonizing people, drawing them into a trap, and John completely falls for it. He doesn't account for Ramsey's gifts at psychological manipulation, which Sansa warns him about. He's kind of thought, ah, oh, this guy is going to do something stupid and honorable because he's not going to be able to control himself, so I'll shoot his brother with a bow and arrow. There's no way he can't gallop towards his brother, who is being shot at with arrows, and try and save him. So he falls into that trap. But he's waited until Jon Snow is within Archer's range so that they can start shooting him immediately. He's seen his brother be killed, so he falls into the next trap of galloping towards Ramsey. Yeah! Yeah! Every step of the way does exactly what he wants him to do. Yeah! Yeah! Probably my favorite shot of the whole season is when we're behind Jon Snow and he sees that cavalry wall galloping towards him. And part of the reason it's such a great shot is it's all real. That's 40 horses charging full speed at Kid Harrington. Until the last minute, I was stood there facing off against this cavalry charge, which is really scary. We're a bit annoyed, because I think everyone's going to think it was CGI, and it wasn't. Camilla, our horse mistress, kept asking every year. She said, give me some more stuff to do. Like, this year was boring. It's just people trotting from here to there in their horses. So finally, we gave her enough to do. I read the outline and went, wow, OK, this is adventurous. How are we, how, how we going to deal with this? It's the biggest amount of horse requirement I've ever had on Game of Thrones. We flew over in May to kind of start discussing what, how we were going to prep it, how many horses we were going to use. We decided on 80 in the end. So when we first see both armies, we'll use 80 on the Stark side, and then we use 80 on the Bolton, so we're using the maximum. Then when we start to clash, we'll split it in half. When we had horses charging past me, those were all real horses. I obviously work very closely with Rowley, putting it all together. And we make channels so it looks like they're clashing, but they're not. The horses are actually just passing through, you know, uh, like two-foot channels so they can clear out. We are going to make that look as close as possible to a collision without actually colliding the horses. So in very tight formation, we'll have those guys cross and they will pull the horses as they cross through. We're falling them onto a very thick falling bed so we don't injure the horses or injure the guys. Um, but we're going to try and make that something that's not really been done before. You want it to feel crowded and mayhem and like, you know, anything can happen any time. But I really don't want anything to happen any time. I want what we plan to happen and it look really cool and, and let's not hurt anybody. <laughs> To get across the field and follow the horses at the speed at which they're moving, and horses move really, really fast, you need a special rig. And the Russian arm is just such a fun machine to work with, and it gives you such dynamic shots. It's basically a camera tracking vehicle. It's a remote control arm that sits on a Land Rover, in our case. Throughout the Battle of the Bastards, we had a number of tracking vehicles, one of which was the Vampire Bat with the Russian arm on it on a muddy, slippery field over about five or 600 yards with very fast horses. That was the vehicle to chase them properly and get the results we wanted. They worked very well. The results were amazing. Go, go, follow your commander! You've got two giant armies that are opposing one another. You know you're not gonna have more than a few hundred extras on one side or the other, so you've got a lot of crowd replication. 
We had a lot of cavalry, a lot of infantry. One one, the giant is involved. Most of it would be photographed, but it also needed a lot of digital enhancement. You've got things happening that you can't shoot in any real way. You've got a giant punching out a horse. We shoot horses falling and charging toward one another that we can use as elements, but we start to get into complex areas that we haven't really broken ground with on the series before, where it is fun and exciting, but also uh, very challenging. Yeah! <laughs> The Battle of the Bastards becomes incredibly compact. All these combatants forced into this incredibly tight space on the battlefield, partly crammed in by bodies. You've got horses, you've got, you know, uh, men of either side just piled up in this massive heap. The body pile was absolutely enormous in terms of its scale and ambition. All of those prop bodies had to be dressed in the appropriate uniforms. We had to have the shields and the flags. You then need to dress the horses in their saddlery. You need to make sure that the correct sigil is on the horse. Even though I know that all of these bodies are fake, it was deeply moving. It's pretty grim. It's very brutal, actually, to look at. I've never seen that before, ever. It comes from reading real accounts of these various battles, both medieval and even more modern ones. You read accounts of battles in the Civil War where the bodies were piled so thick it actually became an obstruction on the battlefield. I think what I was finding throughout filming this was moments of giving up. And the first moment we found that was when the crush starts happening and he just stops for a moment. And then he tries to fight his way back and he gets pushed over, he gets trampled. John is almost literally buried alive beneath the bodies. He was being almost killed by his own men, not on purpose, but just in this wave of fear that and overcomes everyone as they try to get out of the way of this incoming wall of shields. And then something drives him to fight up. And that moment where it comes up and he gasps for breath, he, he's reborn again in a way. Winterfell is a place that really means so much in the context of the show, and the episode is really about bringing things home. The final act takes place in the Winterfell courtyard, and it ultimately boils down to Jon against Ramsay and Sansa against Ramsay. I always wanted to do a scene with Jon Snow. It's really nice to get to sort of have the two bastards there together facing off. It's a horrible moment when you see your hero go a bit too far. The only direction I gave to Kit was he's not a human anymore. He doesn't feel any sympathy, empathy for this guy. We actually spent an entire day, 10 hours, with Kit on top of you and beating him. And I just shot it from every single angle I possibly could. And what we wanted to try and get with that was that he's just kneading bread. He's just flattening this person's face. And that's what's changed in John for me. A monster has risen in him a bit, which I think should be unsettling for the viewers. There's nothing he wants more than to beat Ramsay to death with his own fists, and then he sees his sister I think John then realizes, you know, as he's about to kill him, he's on the verge of death. He realizes this is your fight, this is your guy to kill, because he understands what she's been through. Where is he? It's a very justified ending, so that Sansa has the power in the end. Your house will disappear. Your name will disappear. All memory of you will disappear. It's such a strong moment for her because all her life she's been affected by these men who have just done such terrible things to her. It's nice to get to do a final scene with Sophie after last season. And, and this is the first moment that you actually hear her say, this won't affect me and I'm stronger than that. It's my favorite scene. Her walk away, that final shot was so crucial and just to get that little hint of a smile just right, I think we ended up making poor Sophie do it, you know, 12 or 13 times in the middle of the night. 
It's not a big smile, it's just a little hint of a smile. Sophie doesn't say very much, but I think it may be my favorite thing that she's ever done on this show.